Good afternoon and welcome to our seminar on intelligence analysis with artificial intelligence and Bayesian networks. <clears throat> I'm delighted that we have such a big audience here to this afternoon at the Virginia Tech Applied Research Center and I want to thank you all for coming. Let me start off by introducing our team. Uh, first up is David Abisher. Dave. Dave is very new to our team. He just retired from the Army a little over a week ago, and he's now our Director for Defense and Intelligence. So he's now our point person for pretty much everything related to Washington, D.C. My name is Stefan Conradi, and I'm the managing partner of Basia USA, and I will be your host this afternoon. In a little bit, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our organization and, and what we do, but let me first take you throughout, through our program this afternoon. We're already in the middle of the introduction, and I should pause here for a moment. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, please. Yeah, a little bit. Let me either move that closer. Yeah, please speak up if, if something is not quite right. We can, we can fix it. So, um, as I said, we're in the middle in the, of the introduction. Then I would like to talk about motivations. Why are we doing all this? Why are we talking about artificial intelligence? And in that context, I want to talk about the promise, the peril, and what you may not hear much about, about the limitations of artificial intelligence, some very fundamental limitations. And speaking of limitations, that's how we connect to human intelligence. We'll talk about cognitive limitations and biases in reasoning. And that kind of sets us up for looking into, well, how can we overcome both the limitations of human reasoning and the limitations of artificial intelligence and get to a human machine teaming approach. And really the key point here will be this afternoon that we want to talk about practical artificial intelligence for here and for now. So we're not talking about something abstract in the future. We're trying to stay away from the, the hype of, um, about artificial intelligence and really talk about things that you can do here and now. But we'll continue with the fundamentals for a little bit and need to talk about the dimensions of reasoning. Because as we talk about how we can seek assistance with our human reasoning, we need to understand what that really means. And I will propose yeah, kind of a coordinate system that describes how we can kind of understand the aspects of human reasoning. And in that context, I want to introduce Bayesian networks as a universal reasoning framework. After that, so that should take approximately an hour or so. And after that, I'd like to go into a lot of examples. And we have so much material, I think we could probably stay here until midnight and we still wouldn't be able to cover everything. So we'll have to see how far we, we get by, by five o'clock. This is the first time I'm uh, presenting this presentation in this particular format. So you must forgive me if, I'm, if uh, something doesn't feel quite well rehearsed yet. So uh, with the examples, we start off with um, knowledge encoding and reasoning where we take our domain knowledge and encode it in a formal way so we can then utilize artificial intelligence to help us with inference. First example will be about friend or foe detection. Where is my bag? Should be an interesting example. And then we'll talk about the Monty Hall puzzle that you may have heard about, or um, that's our new title, Choose, Choose Your Battles Wisely. We'll briefly talk about knowledge and elicitation in a formal setting, eliciting knowledge from groups. Then we switch gears, go into uh, knowledge discovery, machine learning, discovering knowledge from data. Uh, one aspect of that will be discovering anomalies. And then the final part, which is one of the most interesting ones, is talking about causal inference. How can we formally simulate interventions in a domain, in a, or rather in a model of a domain, what is required. And Simpson's paradox, 
um, will serve as, as a principal example for that. So in a way, the, um, what I mentioned about the dimensions of reasoning, that coordinate system, we will kind of travel through that with all of the examples we have planned for this afternoon. So, and, and that part should take roughly two hours. So, let me give, give you a little bit of background about our organization. Normally, at this time, uh, we would go around the room and have everybody say a few things about who they are and what they do. However, since we have quite a few folks from the intelligence community, we don't think you would tell us the truth anyway, so we will skip, we'll skip that part. So I'll just tell you about who we are and then hopefully we'll get to meet you and speak to you one-on-one -on -one in the break and, and afterwards. So our company was founded 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, by Dr. Lionel Jouf and Dr. Paul Monteano, who have been researchers in artificial intelligence for many years before they even ventured into Bayesian networks. They had originally developed what turns out now to be Bayesian Lab. They had originally developed this as a tool for their own kind of research purposes to make coding easier. But they very quickly realized that lots of other researchers and analysts had an interest in this technology, so they formed a company, and um, which has gr grown. We're still pretty small, but it has, has, has grown over the years, and now we have a customer base pretty much spanning the entire world. But let me just, um, for, for clarification, mention a few things, because every other word I'm going to say this afternoon has to do with Bayesian. So Bayesia, that's our company. Bayesia Lab, that's our product. That's what you will see in action. But all this is based on the Bayesian network framework as it was invented by Professor Judea Pearl, of whom you may have heard. And I will reference his work again later on. So out of Paul's and uh, Lionel's work over the years, uh, the company has evolved, and by now, what started out as this little utility has evolved into a fairly comprehensive, comprehensive software platform with desktop applications, APIs, web simulators, and so on. So uh, by now, we have an, pretty much an ecosystem of desktop software, web applications, and APIs. Today, we will only touch on core desktop application and talk also a little bit on about the API, uh, not the API, the what we call the Bayesia expert knowledge elicitation environment. It's a very long uh, expression, so we abbreviate it as BKI, and that's our tool for eliciting knowledge from groups and formally encoding it into a Bayesian network. But more about that later. Now, you may not have heard much about us. But our, our customer base is fairly broad and really spans many, many different industries. And in fact, we haven't worked much with the intelligence community in the past, even though we have quite a few clients who in turn are serving the intelligence community. So if you just look at some of the logos, you'll get a sense uh, we work with a lot of companies in the marketing science field, lots of market research firms. Companies like P&G, Unilever, Microsoft, Intel, Dell. Then we have companies like Booz Allen Hamilton. We have the US Army. It's really a very, very broad spectrum, the FDA, the FAA. Um, and we hope that we, we broaden, drop, broaden this further. The key point here about this is that Bayesian networks don't have a narrow, unique application, but they're really a very, very universal research framework. So um, now there, there are so many things we won't be able to talk about today, but for those of you who want to learn more about Bayesian networks, uh, we have a book available that you can download for free that goes into a lot more details about you know, the, the fundamental aspects of Bayesian networks and how to use it. It contains examples, data sets, and, and so on. Uh, I have to warn you though, the book was written based on Bayesia Lab 5.4. Now we're on Bayesia Lab 7, and we're about to release actually Bayesia Lab 8 this fall at our annual conference. So uh, probably by, by sometime this fall, we have a new edition of the book out. 
which will also be available for free download. One more thing before we get started properly. For all of our seminars that we host, we offer these micro credits. And that means if you check in, if you come see us during the break, and if we scan your barcode on your ticket, then you're, you're, we know that you attended, and then you will, uh, by, by the end of the week, receive a formal credit that you participated in the seminar. And um, you may think perhaps that's a little bit of a marketing, marketing gimmick. Well, perhaps it is. But there are so many folks out there who are currently looking for people who have familiarity and awareness of Bayesian networks. So, um, so maybe just a good thing to do. Also, one more thing I should mention, mention and that is that all the slides you see today, uh, you will receive as a download link. So all 250 of them or so. So, okay, uh, any questions so far? We will have a break in about an hour or so, but, in the, but, but please do feel free anytime to grab a cup of coffee. Also, please do feel free to interrupt me, to disagree, to protest if anything, you, anything I say it doesn't sound quite right to you or isn't clear. Um, I don't want this to be a three-hour information download, so, so please, um, please ask questions. All right. Good, let's get started. The motivation for today, the promise, the peril, and the limits of artificial intelligence. And I think artificial intelligence really has become this major, major buzzword where everybody gets totally fixated and thinks it's, it's going to change absolutely every, everything. Um, like you may recall the scene from that movie, The Graduate, where it was all about plastics. Well, now it's, it's artificial intelligence. And um, even some very serious researchers are talking about all the wonderful things that artificial intelligence may do for us. Here's a quote from Stuart Russell, an AI researcher at UC Berkeley. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing him now, AI might cure diseases, might eliminate poverty, it could prevent environmental catastrophes. So this is all very, yeah, fantastic. So a lot of hopes out there. On the other hand, there are also some concerns. For instance, this is what the late Stephen Hawking said back in 2014. The development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Certainly not nearly as optimistic. Um, we have a, get a sim similar sentiment from our friend Elon Musk, who said, if you are not concerned about AI safety, you should be vastly more risk than North Korea. So um, also some more serious researchers have mentioned the same concern. This is just a few days old, uh, was first quoted in the, in the Telegraph, where um, researchers say that AI could be a greater concern than climate change or terrorism, for instance. Okay, um, I will not share my opinion on, on all this, but if we kind of take this so, so a step further, how about if we think about adversaries now taking artificial intelligence <laughs> and using it against us? So now here's a whole new angle to it um, that may be very wor potentially worrying. And perhaps that was one of the motivations why the Department of Defense has committed significant amounts of resources towards AI research. I think this was just uh, from September 7th when I think the $2 billion research budget was announced. So, but that's all kind of far, so to some extent, far into the future. What I want to talk about is or what, rather what I don't want to talk about is, is the hype. I want to leave the hype behind and much rather focus on or, or rather look at w one particular problem of artificial intelligence that's not about uh, AI robots killing us or in, any of that kind of threat, but rather let's talk about what AI cannot do or what the limitations are, which may be a much, much bigger problem for us right now. And one of the things is 
and this appeared in Wired magazine a little over a year ago, they were talking about how our machines now have knowledge that we will never understand. What does it mean? Um, they talk about machines having alien knowledge. Well, it has to do with, with the fact that most of the AI that we pursue today relates to neural networks and deep learning, and it can do fantastic things. It can understand our speech, it can recognize images. It's all absolutely brilliant. It can will soon be able to drive our cars. But one of the problems is these types of models that are generated through deep learning are black box models. They are practically impossible to understand, even though we might be may be able to look at parameters and what's, which nodes are connected. None of that is directly interpretable. So that's a big, big issue that we are facing with AI, and I'll keep coming back to that over and over this afternoon. So that's kind of motivation number one, kind of the promise and the limitation. The next source of motivation is us, or our human limitation in terms of our reasoning ability. And I think it's very easy to understand if we just think about introspectively about how, how we think about the world. Well, there are only so many dimensions that we can simultaneously handle in our head. We, we can be confronted with lots of data, lots of visuals, many screens, fancy visualizations, but in the end, uh, really, we can only get our head around roughly three dimensions. Oh, no. oh. Twelve? <laughs> you, you can do twelve? Okay. All right. So, um, now beyond the limitation in terms of dimensions, we have cognitive biases. We have a tough time dealing with uncertainty. We have difficulties as humans combining observations with theoretical knowledge. And here is a very big one, distinguishing observation and causation. So, well, let me rephrase that. Intuitively, we do this very well, but when we have to reason about that in an abstract way, uh, we get into a lot of trouble. So human reasoning is flawed. This, this is, I think we all must recognize that. And of course, the intelligence community is pretty much the first one to admit that because um, it has put great efforts into disciplining our, our fragile minds. Many analytic te techniques have been developed, structured analytic te techniques. And, and there, there are many books, huge literature on that particular topic. But the problem with all that is these structured analytic techniques, they are like exercises. They are kind of training our minds, but, but the inference, the conclusion ultimately has to take place in our head. It goes it, something, the decision has to happen inside our heads, and it's like putting the decision into a mixer. You know, you take all the evidence and combine it, but what happens inside in the decision maker's head is often not uh, transparent, it's not explicit, it's not auditable, it just happens. All the input goes in and then it gets blended. And that's what we want to get away from. So this is what we want to do instead. What we want to do is propose a modeling framework that is explicit, that is tangible, that can help you understand, to help you think and reason explicitly. So the steps become visible and tangible to you as well as to others who have perhaps have to reason with you. That's why I've chosen this metaphor of a uh, of the me uh, kind of a mechanical model of the solar system, because. I think you would agree with me, as you look at this, you immediately know what that does and what happens if I turn the little crack and how the planets would move and so on. So this is a model that represents the underlying reality, the real world, and yet we can see exactly how it works and we can go through what-if scenarios and kind of look for what stars would be aligned when. This is the kind of modeling and reasoning I would like to get to. 
And I want this to be a two-way street. So it's not just kind of we perhaps generate a model through machine learning and it shows us how the world works, but rather that we can enter into this model our domain knowledge. Because there are so many things, and I think this is particularly true for the intelligence community, that we know things about the world, about behaviors, about um, all, all kinds of things for which no data or barely any data exists. So that understanding, we, we should be able to enter, to augment a model with that, so we can then take the machine learning knowledge and our own human domain knowledge and reason jointly with it. So that's, that's what we want to do today. So the big objective is let's get away from the black box. Um, so he, here's another metaphor, and you'll see I'm, I'm using a lot of metaphors just really principally for my own benefit so I can, I can understand what I'm talking about. I like the abacus as a metaphor because it's... It doesn't do a computation for us, it does it with us. But we can very precisely see what is happening. It's an aid to our head. And in that sense, I would like to use artificial intelligence today. Any questions so far? Yes, Russ. Can you tell me what's the source for that, the A, was A and H for that map you had about two slides back, there was a map of, uh, uh, oh yes. Um, you, you will see the source when you get the slides. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the public domain. It's like an um, Air Force doctrine handbook on intelligence. Okay. I've, but, uh, yeah. I don't want to get uh, too confrontational. Trust, I'm a little curious. You led off with a uh, uh, discussion about how one of the limitations of artificial intelligence is that uh, it's an internal in the black box. We can't understand its reasoning. And then, like I talked about, how the human brain is ultimately a black box as well. If we're going to use artificial intelligence to help us inside our own black box, aren't we just kind of kicking your hand down the road a little bit? Yes, so, so what I want to do is basically get away from the, the AI black box get, and get away from our brain as a black box and come up with a modeling framework that is explicit, that is transpa it's that, that's transparent where we can enter machine learning knowledge we can take our tacit knowledge, translate it into explicit knowledge, so we can then, um, in a very tangible way, operate with that knowledge and perform inference. So, so in a way, you're absolutely right. We want to get away from both black boxes and kind of take the best of both worlds. Does it make sense? It'll, I guess it'll, I'll, I'll see in your approach to that. Yeah. yeah. But please be, feel free to be confrontational. It's, it's always good. So dimensions of reasoning. When we talk about reasoning, probably the first thing that pops into our heads is logic. Like for 2,000 years or so, logic or there has been a close relationship between reasoning and, and logic. And that is not wrong, but what we need to realize is that it is not sufficient for reasoning. And, and the problem is that, and I'll just read you a quote here, uh, from, from the handbook of, the, of logic and the handbook of the logic of argument and inference. And this quote goes, classical logic has no explicit mechanism for representing the degree of certainty of premises in an argument, nor the degree of certainty in a conclusion given those premises. So what this says is that logic is not enough because most of the things we deal with in the real world, they are far from certain. They have some degree of probability. So if we visualize this again, if we look at the strength of an argument, and the, the broadest spectrum of arguments are somewhere from very, very weak to very strong, and at the rightmost edge, that's where you have formal deductive logic that we know that we know and that we like to quote and we like to refer to. But really the rest of the spectrum uh, is probabilistic. So for that reason this will serve as our very first dimension of reasoning. It's um, and I start with Z here for some reason. Um, this will be our axis of the, the strength of argument. On the left hand side we go towards the probabilistic and on the right-hand side, at the outer edge, we go 
to deterministic. Now the question is, well, how can we, with logic, there are clear rules. We all know those, and there are fa logical fallacies and so on. We can implement it with computers. But how do we deal with probabilistic arguments? Well, uh, roughly 2,000 years after Aristotle, um, Reverend Thomas Bayes came up with an approach that allows us to reason with probabilities. And what is now known as the Bayes rule or Bayes theorem, he gave us, in a somewhat differently worded, but he gave us the formula that allows us to update our beliefs in a hypothesis given new evidence. And that really has turned out to be a very, very fundamental formula that, that applied, that has proven to be correct and the true approach for dealing with probabilities, computing with probabilities. And so um, here's another quote that says, Bayesian inference is important because it provides a normative and general purpose procedure for reasoning under uncertainty. This is really it. If you reason under uncertainty, you must use Bayes' rule or whatever, how, whatever approach you take needs to arrive at the very same conclusion. Only Bayes' rule is correct. Yeah, so, so this is kind of an understatement, this quote. So why is this a problem? Why does this uh, concern us? Well, because Bayes' rule and human reasoning is sometimes not consistent. If we look at when we deal with cause and effect, and if we reason in the direction from cause to effect, actually our human intuition is pretty good. It's reasonably consistent with Bayesian inference. However, where we get it very, very badly wrong is when we reason backwards from evidence from effect back to the cause. That's where human reasoning is highly inconsistent with the true normative reasoning. And that's where we get into tons and tons of fallacies. That's a, that's a big problem. And um, what is really scary, if you will, um, and here, here is yet another quote. I, somehow I have lots of quotes in this presentation today. In in law, in, in courts of law, in criminal trials, unfortunately, yes, we have a so question. I just want to in the so before we get to law, um, so correlation, confidence, causation, law. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So okay, good. Um, so it's really not used cor correctly. It's not used. I mean, like when, when juries evaluate an array of evidence, each piece of evidence more or less reliable or, or probable or credible, the only way to correctly combine it, combining all that is Bayes' rule. But of course, it is, it is not used. It's actually controversial. Those lawyers who have proposed using it uh, have, have run into issues in making it clear and making their case in this regard. So well, now what about the intelligence community? Well, if there is any group of people who work with uncertain observations, it's, it's certainly the intelligence, com intelligence community. So um, I thought it would be interesting to browse all publicly available literature on intelligence analysis. And here you just see a small selection of titles there. They're all sitting on my, on my bookshelf now. And I thought, I wonder how prominent Bayes' rule is. And the scary part is, it is only mentioned ever so briefly in two books and only explained in one of them at, at some length. And I think that's, that's really quite troubling. Uh, if that is indeed the normative approach for reasoning under uncertainty, that this topic is almost completely omitted from literature. Yes? Uh, the reasoning for intelligence analysis by um, uh, Noel Hendrickson. Yeah, that's the only one who really spells it out and, and, and explains it. So um, what about the CIA? Of course, I have only access to what is publicly known. I mean, it's not that Bayes' rule is unknown. 
Uh, in fact, there, there have been memos um, in the CIA back in 1972, all since declassified, where it became clear that Bayes' rule is indeed important, and that's the technically correct approach to reasoning. But somehow it all never, never gained any traction. So, I, I, I'm so I was curious. Why, why is that? Uh, am I missing something? You know, there, there is the correct way of reasoning. It's not being used. What, what's the hang-up? And so I came across this thesis by, um, by somebody who, who wrote his master's thesis on analytic methods. Um, and he said, due to the highly mathematical nature of Bayesian decision analysis, many users will, will feel uneasy trusting the resulting assessments. And I thought, Ser seriously? Because it's difficult? You know, because we don't find it intuitive, we, we say, well, you know, it's like me looking at my credit card bill at the end of the month, and it's like, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't feel right. You know, I'm not okay with that computation. So um, anyway, I'm, again, please don't get me wrong, there may be a lot more to the actual work that is not in the public domain, and so I may be misreading all this a bit. But anyway, let's conclude our first dimension here. So we have our x or our z axis, where we need to use Bayes' rule. That's our requirement, and in one small sliver to the very right, that's where we can use logic. So that's our first axis. Let's move on to our second dimension of reasoning. And what prompted me to, to think about that was a paper by Galit Shmueli. She's an Israeli researcher who's now teaching in Taiwan. And she wrote a paper eight years ago about how we need to distinguish between explanatory and predictive models. So she said we really need to keep those objectives very, very separate because the inference that we need to use for both is, is distinct. And this will be a big topic for, for this afternoon. So I want to introduce an axis a model for model purpose, or I could say reasoning purpose, where on the left, now coming back to your point, causation versus correlation, where on the left we have... So on the left, we have everything related to association correlation, which include, includes description, prediction, forecasting, and then on the right-hand side, we have all causal concepts, explanation, simulation, attribution, and uh, causal optimization, ultimately. So that will be our x-axis. Now onto our third axis, the y-axis. This is about where do where does the source for our reasoning or the source for our models come from? And historically, most of what we what we reasoned with either tacitly or explicitly really has come from theory. We have hypothesized about problem domains, then perhaps encoded that in, in formulas and then reasoned with it. Nowadays, of course, we have lots of data, data coming out of our ears, you know, just everything. We have fast computers, clever algorithms, and with those we can automatically generate models just from data. And so um, a number of folks now think, well, you know, if we just have all this data, will it not speak for itself ultimately? You know, if we just have enough storage and a, big, a lot of bandwidth, can't can we just see it? Can, can we read it directly? And that is a major fallacy, unfortunately. Um, big, big mistaken belief that unfortunately really permeates large parts of uh, the world of, of data science. But now let me put all these axes together. So here we have uh, x-axis model purpose or reasoning purpose, uh, y-axis model source. And let me now position where I believe machine learning and artificial intelligence belongs on this map. And I claim it belongs in the upper left-hand corner here. Why? Well, the, the Y position is perhaps quite obvious because clearly machine learning is driven by data, AI is driven by data, but the X position is perhaps really the more interesting one because there's a major, major limitation. 
we cannot enter that space to the right. The causal side is off limits for machine learned models. That's a big, big issue. Yeah? Well, why is that? Or what, what is the big distinction here? Well, on the left hand side, in association correlation, we talk about or we perform inference on given that we see. I observe a variable x, and on that basis, I infer, I compute a predicted value y. On the right hand side, however, it's no longer about just seeing something unfolding on its own. On the right hand side, it's about intervening in the domain where I go in and do x, where I set x to a value of my choosing. So here I have to compute inference on given that I do. And those are two totally different things. The, the, actually, the, the math, the inference computation that I have to do can be totally different. So why is this an issue? Well, because most of our reasoning, most of questions like why, how, what to do, who is responsible, all of those things are on the right-hand side. So now the question becomes, how can we bridge that gap? How can we, you know, how can we even utilize machine learning and AI for our purposes there on the right? Well, there's a way to, to connect that, and that's through domain knowledge. If we are able to augment our our machine learn knowledge with our human domain knowledge, then we can perhaps enter this, the realm of causal reasoning. And that's what we want to do. That's our objective now. And how can we do that? What is the framework that connects this entire space? Well, that's Bayesian networks. Here they are. So that really covers the entire spectrum which means I can machine learn Bayesian networks from data, I can discover them from data, I can discover structure. On the other hand, I can, yes? I'm just wondering, do you make a distinction between domain knowledge and theory? No. Okay. So, so I, I, I look at those uh, as, yes. as the same, yeah. So I can machine learn them, or I can directly introduce my domain knowledge in the form of theoretical knowledge into the network and can directly encode that. And then with that, I have the ability to either just predict, staying on the left, or I can go all the way to the right, performing causal inference. And um, that kind of completes it. Now I can extend it also into my third dimension. I can deal with that on a probabilistic basis. So I can deal with association, causation, I can work with data, I can work with theory, and I can perform inference probabilistically and deterministically. But really, for the most part, we are staying in the probabilistic space. So, well, uh, what specifically is this paradigm, Bayesian networks? It was invented in the mid-1980s by Professor Judea Pearl, who has been teaching and researching at UCLA since 1970. And he had originally invented Bayesian networks as a formalism to represent causal relationships. And we'll talk, talk about that a little bit further in, in a short while. Now, for quite some time, Bayesian networks were contained or remained contained inside computer science. And in most of the devices you will you have, your email spam filter and, and so on, Bayesian networks are pretty much everywhere. But they're kind of hidden inside, deep inside an algorithm or something. What we want to do is make Bayesian networks explicit and accessible to researchers and analysts so we can really work with them directly as a framework. So lots of books have been published uh, on, on this, and only really in the last 10 years or so have Bayesian networks become tools for researchers. So what's under the hood? Well, they're, they're remarkably simple. They're, they're, they're super simple because they only consist of a few components. Um, well, let's look at one. Here, here's a Bayesian network here from a totally different problem domain. This is about modeling, collision speed, collision angle, airbag deployment, and injury severity. Those are variables. Perhaps we have data on those variables from some accident statistics. 
But the structure is very straightforward. Variables of interest are represented, represented as nodes, these blue bubbles, those we call nodes. And then the arrows that connect the nodes, we call them arcs. And these arcs represent probabilistic relationships. So this would say, given a certain level of in, uh, collision speed, there's a certain probability of injury severity. And injury severity does not only depend on collision speed, but it depends on airbag deployment and also on the collision angle. And those, the values for these probabilities are contained in what we call a conditional probability table. So between the nodes, the arcs, and the conditional probability, everything is defined about a Bayesian network. It's really very, very, very simple. So now, um, what, so the formalism is, is very, very straightforward. What, what we've done is we've taken this formalism and translated it into a research software, or if you will, into a research workflow. So we can now either use domain knowledge, expert knowledge, or we can use data, perform knowledge discovery, generate a Bayesian network, and then on that basis, we can analyze, simulate, perform decision support, diagnose, optimize, manage risks, all on the basis of a Bayesian network. And for that, that's why we're here, that's why we promote what we're promoting, our technology, the Bayesian Lab software, because that allows you to encode Bayesian networks, to learn them, to perform inference, analyze, and so on. But really the key point is here and now. So this is not some far-fetched idea that needs lots of research funding uh, that will be ready in, in, in a couple of decades. This is something you can use today, tomorrow, on your desks for your very real-world problems. And actually we have a living example of how that was used. Dave, I'm now speaking about you, uh, in his career in the Army, he has actually used Bayesian networks for, for combat equipment diagnostics. We don't have time to talk about that. That's in itself a 90-minute presentation. Very, very interesting topic, how he has employed, deployed Bayesian networks as a tool for warfighters to diagnose equipment under very adverse conditions. Perhaps you can talk to him about it in, in the break. Very, very interesting. And there's also uh, the reference to the article that was published on, on that topic. You'll have it in your slides. Okay, questions? Yes, please. Uh, sorry, this is a silly question, but I'm relatively new to graphs in general. Um, but what is the relationship between the Bayesian graph and an RDF graph and ontologies? Um, I think pretty much none. There's none? Pretty much none, because the Bayesian network is even though you, you could, it, it's not, uh, there, there is no hierarchical relationship necessarily between the nodes. So, so there's not an ontology that is defined. You could, by machine learning, a Bayesian network perhaps discover a structure that you might interpret as an, something meaningful that could translate into an ontology. But it's like really very, very different. Other questions? Yes. So you talked a little bit uh, about how machine learning and AI can bridge the gap into the um, causal side of things. Do you believe that there's any value to folks seeking that middle ground uh, in using um, something like Monte Carlo theoreticals or some other kind of structured mathematical simulation to um, the model from that side of trying to at least a little over that gap? Um, no. Um, and, 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 and the reason is because there, there is a fundamental limitation. To, and and that, that has to do with the fact that we cannot discover, we cannot machine learn causality. That's the big, that's the holy grail of statistics, trying to figure out to discover causality from data. We can't do that, nobody else can do it, even though it's a very active field of research. So no amount of fancy statistical techniques will push you further into the right. Um, 
So what we need, that's where we need our expertise. And that's why I think also for the intelligence community, that's very attractive because there is a lot of expertise. Now, you guys know a lot about how the world works and uh, can contribute that. Oh. So as many calculations of all these data going in is all important. What I heard earlier that the main knowledge very first order by that, I mean, subject matter. Mm -hmm. Sub so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's a very important point because our assumptions, our human assumptions can be wrong. Yeah. Uh, we have biases and by us formally encoding the biases that, that they right. doesn't make them any right. less. Yeah. So, the yeah, so, yeah. so it's just formalizing the bias. So there are a number of techniques that we can employ, for instance, the knowledge of groups instead of just using the knowledge of individuals to uh, mitigate those biases. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. And in, in some ways, and it just goes beyond the scope of today's seminar, what we try to do is minimize the requirements for human assumptions. And that, that speaks a little bit to your point of how can we push further into the right, because there are ways how we can reduce the requirements for human assumptions for making causal inference. Yeah. So, so that's one of the, the, the things where we can apply some trickery to rely less on our own intuition. Uh, recalling your uh, little slide about uh, that, uh, where do you fit uh, the, a machine that's learning chess or the goal game and through the machine learning or the, does it become an optimization problem or optimization solving based on the, looking at the different aspect of the game and making a decision what will the next move to win the game? Yes. So, um, I'm not sure anybody has ever tried to learn the game chess or Go with a, with a Bayesian network. Uh, but one of the things, one of the interesting things about the, the like, what was it, the Deep Deep Mind or which was the the, the Google uh, algorithm that beat the world champion at, at Go or the Grandmaster? What, what the thing is, you you couldn't look into that program and learn the rules of the game. It just in a black box algorithm that can beat the grandmaster, but we cannot look at it and derive best practices. That's one thing we want to do. We want to learn a model that can then tell us what is the best solution, what is the best policy that we can explicitly extract. And I think that's where these two approaches differ massively from each other. At back, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, and, well, as I said, I've never seen anybody <clears throat> trying to learn a Bayesian network from, from chess, but it's a, it could be a very interesting task. All right. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, speaking of five o'clock, that is, what time, what time is it now? Three. Okay, we have two hours, yeah, okay, good. I, I was starting to panic. Okay, so conceptual advantages. So far I've spoken about Bayesian networks in a very generic way. So what now is, is really useful about them in practice? When we machine learn a Bayesian network from data, which we'll do later, uh, what it does, a Bayesian network represents the joint probability distribution of the underlying data set in a very, very compact way. So that's one of the 
uh, mathematically attractive properties. So from a more practical perspective, in a Bayesian network, we don't need to distinguish between dependent and independent variables. So all variables are treated simult simultaneously, identically. And closely related to that, we have omnidirectional inference. In fact, I have on each of those points, I have a, have a separate slide. So let me, let me go through that. And what I'd like to do is juxtapose kind of traditional regression modeling or linear modeling for comparison purposes. Of course, if you build a regression, uh, a parametric model, there you have to have a dependent and you can have many independent variables. In a Bayesian network, you don't have to make that distinction. You just define nodes. I want to learn between these. And in a Bayesian network, you can have numerical, categorical variables, and all the relationships can be of any nature. You're not constrained to linear relationships or anything of that nature. So perhaps most importantly, and this is what we will use a lot today, with a Bayesian network, we can perform omnidirectional inference. So the evaluation will always be performed in all directions. Of course, that would not be the case in a regression. In a regression, you have to provide values for the axis, and then you can compute it from right to left, and you get an update or you get a value for the y. In a Bayesian network, that's not how it works. Again, a metaphor, a mechanical metaphor, again, a set of gears, and I'm now entering a torque on the leftmost gear, and as you can imagine, as I crank on that turn on that gear, it propagates and all the, the other gears move and I can see how the motion propagates. Yeah? But I could also start on the opposite end. I could start here and then everything would progress backwards. Totally obvious. That's how a Bayesian network works. I can enter observations at any point, at multiple points, and the input propagates to all the other nodes and that's what makes them so attractive. I've already mentioned their probabilistic nature earlier on. This is again very helpful, particularly in the intelligence community, because um, very often we don't have fixed values. We don't have hard observations. We have a set of beliefs from a few different experts. And in the past, we might have rolled up these, these uh, estimates into a mean value, but why don't we use all of them? Let's use the curve, the distribution of expert opinions that we have and keep that uncertainty as evidence as it is, as opposed to boiling it down to a single mean value. In the Bayesian network, we can do that. <coughs> and of course, closely, well, of course, we we couldn't do that in a regression because there we need to work with single point estimates. We need to x equals 5, x2 equals 7, and then we get, let's say, y equals 12 point estimates. In a Bayesian network, I can provide distributions for all of these, and I get my output as a distribution. But now let's get to the point where why Bayesian networks were invented and that is that they can encode causal directions. Let me illustrate this with Newton's second law of motion, which you may hopefully remember from high school, force equals mass times acceleration. And hopefully from high school you will also remember Latin. Um, yeah, right, okay. And, very good. Uh, um, so, Interestingly, Newton didn't, didn't express it in, um, in a formula. Of course, he expressed it in, in, in Latin, and he referred to acceleration as mutatione motus, and force, v motrici impressa. And even for those of you, come on in, take, take a seat. Um, uh, for those of you who don't speak Latin, the, the impressa says everything. The force that impresses. So the force impresses on the acceleration. So that is not a mere equality, but rather what Newton meant that this is a causal assignment. Force causes the acceleration. And to us, it's totally obvious because we know that. 
But if you now transform this, if you rearrange that and write it as mass equals force over acceleration, perfectly valid transformation, um, that of course is just an equality. That is no longer, a causal interpretation is no longer possible. So, but from the equality sign, we can't see that. We cannot make that distinction. We, we need to read it from the commentary or from the footnotes or what have you. And that's where Judea Pearl said, this is really not adequate. We cannot be precise. This is, this is too, too casual dealing with causality. So what he proposed was the form of a Bayesian network where you can be very, very specific about what is, what is the causal direction. And so here in this case, he could translate the, 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 the equation into a simple causal network. Now, here's a warning that I need to add. As it turns out, you can also use Bayesian networks in a non-causal way. And later this afternoon, we will do that. The first few Bayesian networks that we learn, that we build, that we build by hand, will utilize our causal knowledge, but then later on as we machine learn Bayesian networks, those machine learn networks are not causal. And they are great, use, great uses for them as well. So, questions up to this point. All right, then I think we're ready for, for example, for examples. And what I'd like to do is now take our map of analytic modeling and reasoning, and now go through this space quadrant by quadrant. And in fact, uh, we will skip one quadrant, the one that's perhaps least relevant to what we're doing, and that is the one in the upper left-hand co corner, quadrant two. That's about pure predictive modeling, because anybody can do predictive modeling with regardless of whether, whether it's regressions or neural networks or decision trees. So that's a very, very well-covered field where Bayesian networks can offer many benefits, but they're not perhaps not as crucial. So where we want to go is start with quadrant one, where we want to encode our own domain knowledge and then reason with it, and then uh, proceed to quadrant three, where we want to discover knowledge from data, and then finally go into formal causal reasoning in the fourth quadrant here. So let's start with quadrant one. Um, and so this is going straight into a military topic. And I stay clear of sort of current political questions. So I go back to what I remember when I was in the, did my military service in Germany, which was right then in the summer of 1989. So I quite vividly remember um, luckily not combat, but the theoretical scenario of combat that could have happened at that time. Um, for those of you who are a little bit familiar with it, uh, with, with, the, with the Cold War, you will know about the Fulda Gap and the role it would have played in a potential military conflict. And what's really quite amazing, if you, if you think about it, if you think through what could have happened, what you would have had at that time, had a conflict happened, you would have within a 60 mile radius, you would have had at least um, eight nations, troops and tanks of eight nations come to, together in a very, very small space. So West German troops, East German, France, Canada, USA, Czechoslovakia, Soviet Union, further from the south, Hungarian troops from the north, perhaps the Belgians would have helped, and so on. So can you, can you imagine in a 60-mile radius all these troops converging with um, tons of different tanks? So this could have, would have been the, the prime battleground um, of many different types of tanks, and so it is very easy to imagine how in the fog of war that that provides a, a huge challenge to the warfighter. Um, well, who is who, friend or foe? Uh, with all these different tanks and even with, with, within the, the Soviet side, there, there are like half a dozen different tanks and so on. Of course, 
Uh, the Ar U.S. Army prepared their soldiers for it. Uh, there were tank identification handbooks explaining all the char characteristics of all the tanks. But of course, um, when you are in the battlefield, the tank doesn't look like this. It probably looks something like that. You know, that's how you see it, literally in the fog of war, or like this. And then all the theoretical descriptions that sounded so clear in the handbook now, you know, become very difficult to apply. So it's perhaps not surprising that, you know, even today, fratricide is, is, remains a huge uh, concern in, in battle. And one could certainly imagine that that would have been a very difficult situation at that time as well. So we, we want to now take this hypothetical situation and build a decision support tool for the differential identification of battle tanks. What we want to do is provide a tool that makes it as easy and quick as possible to figure out is this a Leopard tank, is this an M1A1, is it a T80, and so on, or actually not even go that far. All the soldier really needs to know is his friend or foe. Now, he doesn't really need to know, you know, the, all the technical specifications, but how do we get in the quickest possible way to reduce the uncertainty about friend or foe? So what, we really, what this really is, is an inference task. We need some sort of tool that allows us to update our probabilities of a certain tank type, given the things that we can observe about it such as like, you know, uh, the probability that a tank is an M60 given, this is the official probabilistic nomenclature, probability of M60 given turret shape, barrel length, road wheels, road wheel distance, support rollers, what have you. Yeah? So that's really the task that the soldier has in his in his head. But what we want to do is we want to create a knowledge, knowledge base and an inference engine. So kind of a tool where the soldier can dial in what he sees. Okay, I observe five road wheels and no support rollers. So this must be a Soviet tank. So this is a foe. So that with the minimum amount of information, we can perform maximum inference. So we're not going to build this network yet. We'll build a network in a little bit. Here, I, I've simply taken the tank identification handbook and some other sources and translated it into a simple Bayesian network. You have a question? So what foe? I mean, there could be three foes, right? So what foe? So Warsaw Pact. Warsaw Pact. Yeah, no, That's our foe. Okay. Yeah. It was and oh. is and, yes. Okay. So that's what, so. Okay, so, so, so here, here is the network, and the way it is structured is as follows. Um, here we have the tank type, that's the node that represents the tank type, and then we have additional nodes that each represent a particular characteristic. Number of support bones, road wheel size, road wheel distance, and so on. And then we have a further node up there that reflects nation, and that nation has associated nodes, child nodes, if you will, that, for instance, reflect what language is spoken, what uniforms this, these troops might wear, and whether it's friend or foe. That, of course, is a deterministic relationship. You know, Czechoslovakian, foe. West German, friend. East German, foe. So that's a deterministic relationship that's very easy to encode. Some other relationships are not deterministic because you know, there's a wild mix of uniforms, and you know, some already have camouflage uniforms, others have solid colored uniforms. But whatever knowledge we have, we can we can encode. And once we have encoded it, uh, here we see actually a screenshot of Bayesia Lab. Then we can perform inference. And I just want to now switch into Bayesia Lab to show you what that looks like in practice. Okay, here is the network. Let me reset all, uh, all pieces of evidence. 
On the left hand side, we have what we call the graph panel. That's where the graphical structure resides. And then on the right hand side, that's where we have what we call the monitor panel. That's where we see the distributions, the values, and, or rather how the values are distributed in all the nodes. So, and as long as we don't have any evidence applied, we just have the marginal distributions. From our intelligence sources, we know roughly who's got how many tanks, you know, and we have the technical data of the tanks and so on. So this, before we set any observation, we just have, have, have the, the, if you will, the big picture. But now we could, let's assume we're in the field, we're perhaps uh, in a reconnaissance squad and we're out, out somewhere, we are isolated from, our, from the rest of the troops and we're now confronted in a situation where we need to identify the, track, the tank that's hiding 200 yards away from us, this is a friend or foe, uh, how can we most quickly reduce our uncertainty? Excuse me. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's our pri our belief of the distribution of tanks in that particular theater in in the Fulda Gap. And that could also be changed, you know, as, as you know, tr you have troop movements, you could update that belief. So this is, this is also from assumptions about the number of troops nations have, you already know. Yes. Or, so what about like road, uh, road wheel size, that's based on the number of tanks you think each nation has and then the attributes? So yes. Yeah, so, so, averages. So, so here in, in this case, this was based literally on the documentation that was available in the mid-1980s about, I mean, when I was in the military, I remember the books that said, okay, now memorize these shapes of the tanks and remember how many wheels they have. So I derived this network from that information. And that, of course, could be wrong, too, because, you know, typically you don't have a tank to examine, uh, a foreign tank that you could study in detail. So some of those may be vague assumptions. Uh, at the time, the T-80 was, was a relatively new tank, so nobody had ever seen one up close. And you had an estimate of each nation's number of tanks. Exactly. So if I understand this right, in this base setting, before we start entering any more variables, this is more deterministic rather than probabilistic because it's, here's our full population size. If we were to have random encounter a tank, it would most likely have Yes. So if we, if we just walked out into a field and opened our eyes, chances are there would be a 17.92% chance that we're hitting on an M1A1. Yeah. Which is a good tech, yes. And as we go out and we then encounter a tank and we start to gather data, that's like, okay, what is the probability if it has six road wheels that it is yes. under Exactly. Exactly. And we want to minimize the effort. What is the least amount of information that we require to make an identification? Because the, the thing is, you can't remember all that. Because it's not just tanks, you need to remember all kinds of other things. So how can you reduce the cognitive load about diagnosis? This originally came out of the medical field. It's, it's, and this, this is being used for medical diagnosis, where you have often many, many more conditions. You don't have a nice, si finite set of possible tanks. You have a set of all possible diseases. So I've just adapted this here for, for our purposes. Yeah. So here, it means it's a, it's a causal direction. So in this case, the, the nation sits at the very top. Your the nation determines what language you speak. Um, the nation determine, or the, determines what uniform you wear, and it also is the cause of whether you're a friend or a foe. Yeah, and then that det also determines which tanks you have. Exactly, that's what we're doing. Because top-down, it's very easy. 
Yeah, the, the tricky part is back up uh, from bottom from the uh, from the observation from the effect back to the cause. That's what we want to do, and that's where Bayesian networks are so powerful. So let's do that. Um, and let, let me start with entering some uncertain evidence. Let's assume we see a tank and it's heavily camouflaged, leaves and nets are all over it, but we think we see at least six road wheels. So I'm now going to enter that evidence. I'm saying it could be six or more. The only thing I know it's not five because I already see more than five, but I just, I don't know, could, there could be a seventh hiding under some netting or something. So based on that, we already, I've set my first piece of evidence here on this node, which has turned green. And we see that the probability of friend has already gone up, has already changed. And we, have, we see that the probability distribution of the tank type has changed and of the nation and of all the other nodes. So, so now given what we've just entered, we've all, all the other nodes have been updated. Okay, let's let's continue. Perhaps um, let's look, and and I'm I'm using my evidence as it comes up, kind of what whatever I see. Let me utilize it for what the, for what it's worth. Let's look at turret shape. I believe um, I th believe the turret is kind of angular, but I'm not entirely certain. And I can perhaps ask some of my guys, what do you think? And they're perhaps not even in agreement. But perhaps we settle on 75% uh, probability that the turret is actually angular in shape. And there's often lots of stuff in armor and active armor on the Soviet tanks and so on. So it's sometimes really just difficult to see. And now our probability of friend has gone up to 66%. And now what? Um, and we can either enter our observations as they come in, as we see them, or we could specifically search for what is the ideal thing to observe next. Because often uh, looking at that stuff means getting out of your hiding spot and getting closer, which exposes you to, to danger. So you want to be very careful, you know, do I really want to count the support roller wheels, you know, or... Do I perhaps, or do I perhaps try to listen when they start it up? Yes. Sorry, you back and forth just a couple times. Yes, I'm, I'm removing that. So currently, after we enter the evidence on road wheels, we are at 52% friend. Now I'm adding, edit, at, entering, let's say, let me, oops a 75% probability that it's an angular turret shape. So now our probability of friend goes up to almost 66%. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so in, in a moment we will use the adaptive questionnaire that guides me in terms of what should I ideally check for next? What would give me the most information? But let's say now, Okay, we hear um, the engine starts up. We, we the, the 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 tank in question starts up the engine, and we can hear what it sounds like. And it sounds like we think it's a gas turbine. But of course, if you've never heard a gas turbine before, you know, it may not be so easy. So, I will set evidence here on let's say ninety percent. I'm sure it's it's a gas turbine. So based on that, actually, our probability of friend has reduced a little bit because it could also be a T80 that some of those have a gas turbine engine and so on. So we could now keep going at that. But the important part is that we can very precisely quantify what, how our prior belief was adjusted. And we can also look at what additional pieces of information would push us in what direction? What would support our hypothesis as opposed to what would disagree with it? And here I'm just running one of the reports that is available. 
it would say, for instance, if we now heard English, then that would very strongly support the hypothesis, it's a friend. But if we heard German, that would disagree with it. That would say that goes the opposite direction. And, and so on. So it's so like... So we, what if you heard Czech? Well, Czech I don't have in here, but that so that means actually this network is not complete. So, uh, but Czech would probably mean um, it's a foe. Yes, Russ. So you, earlier you mentioned that the system is going to make a recommendation. Yes. No, it's not. Let me let me now do that. That's what we call the adaptive questionnaire. And again, this comes out of the medical domain. This now orders our variables in the way that would give us the most information with regard to identifying friend or foe. So the most, the, 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 what would quickly give it away is language. But for language, we'd have to be very, very close that we hear the soldiers in the tank talk. So we may not be able to observe that. The next one is support rollers. So let me say I see three. Given three support rollers, um, actually a lot of other pieces of evidence have dropped off because they are determined by three support rollers. So now the next question is turret shape. And if I now were to answer that it's definitely angular, then we're at 100%. So now we know between five support, three support rollers and an angular turret, I can be sure I don't need to know anything else. That gives me certainty that uh, this is this is a friend. Yeah. So can we? So this way we can cut down on the number of steps and in the quickest possible way reduce our uncertainty regard with regard to our objective. So, um, yes. What? Well, let me. Uh, we can also visualize that. Let me just do that here. Um, I can visualize, for instance, the mutual information with the target node. Now, I'm, now the node size is proportional to the information that is provided with regard to friend or foe at the marginal distribution. Yeah? And as I start to observe things, things change. So for instance, if I say uh, turret shape angular, I've set my first piece of evidence. Now the role, the importance of each additional piece of evidence changes and so on. So I just wanted to show this to you as an, an example how we can work with a given Bayesian network. Somebody else encodes his knowledge and we can just utilize it. We can use it on a laptop, on an, on an iPhone, whatever device we have, on a web browser. In fact, we could now take this and immediately publish this to the web. So, of course, perhaps not in military applications, but for medical applications and others, our clients very often take the models they build and then make them available to the wider world. So, any questions on this example? Yes. Uh, yes. Exactly. Good, very good point because both speak German uh, with very different accents, I would say. But to to you guys, to an American, would probably sound the same. So so yes. So so German would provide very little information about friend or foe. So let's try that. So let me send set uh, language to German. You know, it barely changes anything because it could be East German, German speaker, or West German, German speaker. I'm West German, by the way, just to make it. <laughs> Yes. So on some of the examples, you said that, uh, like the, the Indian boys, you heard the Asian stars start out, so you said uh, they have like language and chances and jazz turbulence. We talked about how we saw kind of the turret in a 75% chance Yes, I mean that would be kind of the ideal world that you um, 
you, you tra trained. Uh, and it, this is something actually closely related to what Dave did in his work in, in the Army, where if you build this application for the warfighter as an end user, you would uh, ideally provide pictures at the same time. You don't just uh, have a little box that you need to tick, but rather it says, okay, you need to distinguish between these two shapes. And you look at it on your screen and you look at the object, which which one, what's more yeah, like? I, I, I actually, I think I prefer the, the, the probability. Right? Yeah. The one that's, uh, your, your vision being obscured, right? Yeah. Maybe you're not getting the big pictures. So, uh, but uh, I wonder, though, is maybe you provide some type of uh, sensitivity analysis because it could be very different if there's two different observers see the same yeah thing. absolutely 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 so 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 in that case you would actually if you have multiple people who judge it you want to actually combine that because that gives you then a, a, a sense of confidence if somebody says it's 50 50 the other one says it's 99 uh, you you We'll want to be careful about going with the 99%. Yeah. Yeah. This also turns into leaders knowing their, well, basically it's source validation from an intelligence perspective. If you as a collection manager know that this source yes, is exactly. spot on every single yeah. time, Whereas this source is a little less than... Uh, absolutely. If, if you know that one of your team members, he's been in a tank unit before, you know, He's driven these things. He knows what he's talking about is very different than somebody who's never seen a tank before in his life. It turns into a question of source validation. Exactly. And that may shift your collection manager's decisions about how do I make each... Exactly. And that's, that's what we will be using in particular as we elicit knowledge formally to build networks uh, because we may have different levels of expertise among the subject matter experts that we enter. So, so you do provide a way to, to take those different observations yes. and, and aggregate them or show the range? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And that's very important for building networks because we want to see how strong is the consensus between experts as opposed to where is there really a different school of thought among folks. Okay. We need to... Yeah, you could, you, 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 could, you could enter that. You, you could enter that, and even though very few would be able to observe that, but there may be some people who, who you know, have... Yeah, Ab absolutely. I think you, you had a question. So, the part that, that I'm not so sure about is the priors. Like, what kind of knowledge do you need to have? Like, I often have to do predictive calls where I have tons of variables and where I don't have a lot of domain knowledge on something. Mm -hmm. Can I apply this to those problems where I, I know very little about the priors? Yes. Yes. It was about how can you apply this to um, domains where you have very little prior knowledge. So for instance, here we might not know how many tanks are out there. So what we can enter is our, our best guess, what reflects our current degree of certainty or uncertainty. Can you just, so when you're inputting data, are you inputting one observation at a time, or are you putting the whole distribution that you've seen so far? Uh, you can do it step by step. So, so you can interactively update. With one observation. Okay, I've just observed this, and now where does it take us? If, it, if our one observation already determined it's a friend, then I can stop. You know, then I don't need to collect other things. I can just... What if you started with totally no knowledge? Would you trust the part? I mean, you just get one observation. Clearly, you couldn't trust it. So when do you start to trust Well, it? here in this case, you have to make a judgment when, you know, do you conclude at 90% probability it's a friend or 95? Well, it gives you the probability. It gives you the probability. Okay. And, and so it, it depends on what you plan to so do. Is there a way you, that you say that your domain knowledge is junk? You can put in a percentage. In, in that sense, you can enter a uniform distribution and say, 
I don't know how many tanks they have. We have eight nations. Let's assume they have all the same amount of tanks or, so, or something. Uh, you know, you, you, could, you can enter your uncertainty, your complete ignorance in this regard. Okay. And then you can, you can change that as you, actually, as you observe. If you see, you know, I only see Soviet tanks everywhere. Everybody just report. Then you can increase the, the number of Soviet tanks so in your you're model. you're kind of assuming that the instances that you see are random and not yeah, so you can then also take take that into account, yeah. yeah. All right. Very nice. Okay, uh, we need to keep moving. Um, uh, where's my mouse? My mouse just disappeared. Here we go. And um, yeah, so, so this is this this would be kind of the vision, a, a an application how that could look like. Um, so, but anyway, let's switch gears. Uh, Non-military topic. Originally, I was going to talk about the Battle of Waterloo and how we can analyze that with artificial intelligence. But I'm not sure everybody really appreciates military history. And you have to explain so many things about who's who and the Prussians and the French. And I thought, you know what, let me, let me use this example, which refers to exactly the same inference, but it's perhaps a slightly more uh, easy to understand topic. So the topic is as follows. This is a story from my life. This was about me traveling from Singapore, where we have a small office, via Tokyo Narita to LAX, heading home. So, um, and in this particular case, there was so, so let me tell you the full story. So I checked in in Singapore, but as soon as I checked in, there was a typhoon in the South China Sea, which they have there frequently. So my departure was delayed significantly. Finally, my flight took off. I arrived at Tokyo Narita, but then I had to race across the terminal to get to my new departure gate. Okay, so I made it just in time. They said, okay, no worries, the plane is still here. But um, I asked, well, what about my bag? Will my bag make it in, will my bag make the connection? So we'll basically, I, I raced across the terminal, but will the bag make it too? So the, the gate agent said there's a 50-50% probability that my bag will make it. So I get on my flight to LAX. And then once I arrive at LAX, I wonder whether I will see my bag. So here's the scenario. I'm, I'm at LAX. This is not me, this is a stock photo. Um, I, I, I see luggage is being delivered. I wait, and after five minutes, I still do not see my bag. The question is now, what is the probability that I will still get my bag? I I just at all. Okay. Will will it? Like three days. No. <laughs> yeah. So let's say by the end of the day. Basically, what I want to know: Did my bag get on that plane? You know, because if it was on there, then I'll I'll get it ultimately that same day. But. If not, then it's going to be tomorrow or the day after. So my question to you is now, what do you think? What is the probability? I, I've waited for five minutes after they started unloading the bags. What is the probability that I will still get my bag? Less, still Less than 50%? Are bags still coming out? Bags are still coming out. 50-50, unchanged. So is it less than 50, you say unchanged? No, no, no priority. I'll go with less than 50 50, unless you are seeing people you got on the plane with getting their back. Ah, you're going to part two of the problem. You read the book. <laughs> because we, we, I read the directions, I'm sorry. Okay, good. So, so yes. Um, okay, so let's, let's solve that now. So, what do we do here? Because we know very little about this domain. It's, it's really, we know practically nothing, and, but we still want to reason about it correctly. So we, what we want to do is encode our very limited knowledge into a Bayesian network and then perform probabilistic inference. Let's do that. So let me leave PowerPoint and now start with a 
blank graph panel, and now we want to encode our problem domain. What, what can we observe about this domain? What are the variables that should play into this? First variable would be whether the bag was exposed out of the search. Say again? The first slide. That's 100%. It made it, it definitely was on the first flight from Singapore to Narita. That's, that's good. I see you started to require probability with the agent that told you. Okay. How many typhoons are in the environment? We'll park that, the question of typhoons. Yes. Let's start with that. So we have knowledge from the gate agent that there was a 50-50% probability that my bag was on the plane that just landed at, um, at LAX. So I Which called... This goes to her question earlier, what do you do when you don't know, right? Yeah. In, in that sense, in this sense, 50-50 is perfect ignorance. It's a, it's a time cost. Do you have a baseline of, you know, sort of accuracy level of getting bags places that you might and you know, if, if we had that, we could encode that. But at this time, we don't know anything other than what we just said. So that, that's the problem. Uh, because very often we just say, okay, who knows? Nobody could know. And especially when you're with your spouse and who says, oh, you should have taken just uh, carry-on luggage. And the, the reasoning becomes very quickly unreasonable. What we want to see is how can we properly reason about this. Okay, let's take... Your assumption, or rather your, the gate agent statement, 50-50. And after this example, we'll, we'll take a break just to give um, manage expectations. So I'm, I have opened up this node, given it a name, and I'm now, and by default, new, nades, new nodes have states true and false, which is perfect here. I can directly enter that and say, okay, so I fully defined my first node. That's my marginal probability that my bag was on the flight from Narita to LAX. So what's, what other nodes can we observe or do we need to include? Typical and load time. Typical and load time? Yeah, very good point. Uh, I make an, I'm, I'm just making an assumption. I'm saying it's 10 minutes. Probably not realistic for LAX, but for Singapore, it would be, but not probably not for LAX. Let's say 10 minutes typical unload time. Yeah? We, we will need to use that. When you change planes, do those bags instead of flying over the system? First come, first out? We don't know. We really have no idea. How many passengers? You know, this would all be part of an extended model. We just look at the very, very core problem at the moment. Later on, we can make this a lot more complex. If we, you know, we have time, we're waiting on our bag, we can ask a lot of things and so perhaps... how long have you been waiting five minutes and you've got a 10 minute correct here, so that's another 50-50. You've got the right carousel. I, I'm at, we are at the right carousel. Okay, what can we observe? What, so what, are there bags in the carousel that look like yours? No, uh, our, my bag is pink. You will, you will see it. <laughs> the number it's, of people came out. See? No, no. Let's, the, the node we need to include here is my bag on carousel because that's the only thing I can actually see. That's the other, there's one more thing I can observe. But let me first define this. I call this node my bag on carousel. And what, um, what other node does play into this? What variable? Time, exactly, time. So time, I enter the, create a node time. And how are all these causally related? What causes what? Yes, but that is already that information is already contained in the fifty-fifty probability that the gate agent gave us. Yeah. So we, but this would be the extended model again. 
when we just think at the big, think of the bigger picture. Yes. Well, are your bag on the plane and time down to uh, is your bag on the coast? Like this, my bag on plane and time, right? Okay, yes, that's the causal structure. Because, so uh, now what we need to define is the probabilities. And let's start with time. And time has the attractive property property that it evolves in uniform steps. So we simply generate 10 or time steps from 0 to 10 and assign a uniform probability. Time just progresses, so that's taken care of. Now the interesting part is how we define my bag, actually it should say on carousel. Why did I miss that? My bag on plane. Okay, so now we need to define my bag on plane as a function, not, no, my bag on plane as a function, sorry, my bag on carousel as a function of my bag on plane and time. So we need to fill out this table. So I would argue half of the table is very easy to fill out. Why? Exactly. If the if my plane, my, if my bag was not on my plane, uh, if my, my bag was not on the plane, then it will never appear. I can wait forever. So I, the top half is very easy to fill out. What about the bottom part? Here I'm making the assumption that the unloading happens evenly. So I'd assume that in minute zero, when they just start to unload, there's a zero probability of getting the bag. And then in 10 minutes, the fullness of time when all bags are unloaded would be 100% probability. Okay, And then if I make the assumption that everything proceeds evenly, so we, Okay. There, there could be all kinds of uh, all kinds of external interventions, but we'll just keep it simple here. So uh, I've now defined the probabilities of how the bag will appear on the carousel. Okay. Now we have fully defined this Bayesian network. And we can use that for inference. So let me make this larger. So has anybody changed their opinion? We had less than 50% remains unchanged at 50-50. Does anybody think the probability goes up? Well, I mean, specifically, the other decks coming out have no relevance, you know, as the easier back on the plane. So I would argue that, I mean, like, what's your point? Okay. By the other point list. I'd argue that it's not a continuum. Time is a high understanding. Okay, interesting. I, I restrict their record if you are going to hold audience numbers to the projections that are made based on the uh, evidence you provided. Technically, uh, the first five values for your time should be 100% false because we stated as the initial premise that you came in at Five yeah, no, we will, we will do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We will, okay. absolutely. Yeah. No, 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 no. People who offer percentages of 50 to get the first So now we want to simulate. Now we want to say it is five minutes. Five minutes have passed, and I have not yet seen my bag. So that's the inference. So, given that five minutes have passed, I've not seen my bag, the probability that my bag is on the plane has gone down to 33%. Minute six, 28%. Minute seven, 23%, and so on. So, what is interesting here, because this looks so trivial, but really it is, it is not. Uh, what we are doing here is intercausal reasoning. We are reasoning from one cause, time, via the effect, back to the other cause. And the thing is, we just can't do that in our heads. 
I would challenge you, even if I gave you a pad of paper and the rest of the day, most of us, including myself, would not be able to solve that, you know, algebraically, you know? It, that would be very difficult. However, what was very easy for us was to encode our domain knowledge, as simple as it is, into a graph, define our assumptions, enter them, and then let the artificial intelligence do the heavy lifting. Basically, the things that we can do intuitively at all. Not even, not even with an Excel spreadsheet we could do that. The, this inference computation is, is not tractable for, for, for humans, no? So that's what we are doing here. We can also do this a little bit more um, elegantly. We can uh, plot a curve and analyze uh, the, the, the and plot how, how time progresses or Rather, on the x-axis now, we have time. On the y-axis, we have the probability. And we see how the probability declines. What's interesting, that's not... To me? It has nothing to do with false positives. So what we have, what's, what's interesting here is um, that this is not, a, not linear, even though all the assumptions we entered are linear the response here is not linear. And um, I can't even ex explain it statistically, but um, I think it's a very, very in interesting feature. So anyway, we're, we're starting to, to run out of time. Um, this example that I've just described is described in much greater detail in Judea Pearl's latest book, The Book of Why. And I haven't copied it from Judea Pearl, rather it was the other way around. Judea Pearl picked up my example, which I'm very, very excited about. But there he goes into a lot more details about all aspects of, of this. And in our book, you'll find further iterations of this example, such as, you know, if I see my, my colleague who was on the same itinerary and he gets his bag, what, how does it update my belief in my bag? And the whole point here really is, we know so little about this domain, so many things are entirely uncertain, yet we now have an approach to reason about it properly. I was just gonna ask, is that book about Bayesian reasoning? It is about, partially about Bayesian re reasoning. It's a lot about, it's mostly about causality, but Bayesian reasoning is a key ingredient there. Hi highly recommended. So just to, to re-emphasize that, where is the artificial intelligence in here? It's really performing inference that's intractable for humans. That's where the int artificial intelligence comes in. So, any further questions on this example? No, oh, yes. Uh, entropy was, in a way, always there. So, because entropy is a measure of uncertainty, and so we could have looked at how the entropy of our bag on plane changes. How the entropy goes from one all the way down to zero. It's just measuring, it's quantifying the uncertainty through entropy. So, so it's always, uh, entropy is always there as a quantity that we could visualize or, or display numerically. We just haven't done it here. Okay, with that, um, let's have a coffee break. And um, before I let you go, let's, for those of you who haven't had their badges scanned yet or their tickets, please uh, see me or Dave. We'd like to scan it because in that, um, if we scan it, then you will get the slides and you will get um, the, the credits for participating in the seminar. All right, uh, before I continue, I am meant to introduce two additional individuals who are not formally associated with Bayesia Lab, but who have a lot of expertise in Bayesian networks and who have been working as consultants in this field for, for, for many years. Uh, let me introduce Freeman Marvin from Intelligence Decisions. In, 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 <clears throat> innovative Decisions. I've been talking too much about intelligence, so innovative decisions. Um, 
right local nearby, great source, great resource for consulting on Bayesian networks. And is Neeraj here, or is he still out with the cookies? He's in back. Well, perhaps I can introduce him later. He's he's also um, nearly local and uh, particularly works in marketing science. So, uh, who's heard of the Monty Hall problem? Okay, I think we've quite quite a few there. So let's. I've seen it so many times. I wanted to make it a little bit more interesting and perhaps a little bit more relevant. So I wanted to translate this into a military scenario and. The experts among you will tell me whether this makes any sense or not. So our mission is, our hypothetical mission assignment is, we need to destroy an enemy, a secret enemy aircraft deep inside enemy territory. And we have managed to trace this aircraft to a military base. And this aircraft that we're meant to destroy is situated in one of three separate underground hangars inside, sort of in the mountainside, inside this facility. So three possible locations on this air base. And therefore, it would be quite natural if it could be in one of the three, there's a one in three chance of hitting our target with our first strike. So let's go there. Completely arbitrarily chosen an uh, in, in airfield in a very remote part of the world. So let's just take a moment to, to fly there. The choice of countries purely at, at random. So here comes the airfield into view. And here's the mountain. And here we see the road that leads up to these three mountainside hangars. So here they are. And they're big enough to accommodate uh, jet fighters. And yeah, as I said, there are three of them. So the, the conditions that we expect here at this facility is that they're all guarded by infantry soldiers. Furthermore, this base has two infantry fighting vehicles, which can be dispatched almost immediately to any place on this airbase. So that's what we are confronted with or potentially confronted with as we approach this facility and in pursuit of our target. Given that um, the, our target could be in one of the three underground hangars with equal probabilities, the commander of the operation selects hangar number two. But it's really a random choice. There, there's no information that we have that would favor one over the other facility. So, so here we are. So we, uh, and the details of the, how we get there with helicopter or whatever, that doesn't really matter. We're managing to breach the perimeter of this facility and are now pursuing hangar number two. We're approaching it. As we cross the valley, we're out in the open. So of course, we're being detected. And as soon as we're triggering our, the enemy, they pull up with their infantry, with their, with their fighting vehicles, and position them as defense in front of hangars one and two. Since they only have two vehicles, Hangar number three remains unprotected, and therefore we see, obviously, our target couldn't possibly be in hangar number three. So they are only protecting one and two. So obviously, then it's in either one of these. One is a true target. The other one is a decoy, or perhaps there's something else in there that they want to protect. So, so here we are. We're approaching hangar number two. They are pulling up immediately and position themselves in front of number one and two. Number three remains unprotected. So at this point, our situation is we have enough time and firepower to overpower the enemy forces in one location, but we can't do both. So we have to carefully choose, or rather we can pick one battle on this occasion and we have the chance of completing our mission, yeah? but we can't do both. So the question is now, uh, what do we do? Uh, we can only 
go after one underground tunnel at this, at this point. So um, the question now is, do we proceed with our original objective of attacking hangar number two, or should we potentially change our objective and go after hangar number one instead? So, so this is the question now. Here we are, we could proceed to number two, or we could now proceed and change our plans and go to number one instead. What do you think? Who's? We have to change to number one. You, we need to change to number one. Any other thoughts? Is there any more information, any more information available? No, that's it. That's ask all we have. Okay, okay. Number three. That's just good Okay, so, so they're tricking us. Okay. So so who who thinks we should stay with number two? Okay. Yeah. So a few number two. Who thinks we should change to number one? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So okay, so 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 quite a few of you already have, have have seen the answer. Well, how do we solve this? Well, the the solution to this. Well, the the answer is we double our chance of finding our target by switching to number one, and that is seems entirely counterintuitive because how how would our choice have any impact on, on, on where this is? And, and this was actually in a, the, the Monty Hall puzzle. Um, you can Google it and you'll find lots of um, information about it and how it came about, this, this, this puzzle and how it was resolved and how even some of the world's most famous mathematicians have refused to believe it. But let me show you the solution right now. And to, to be perfectly honest, each time I look at it, I find it completely counterintuitive and struggle believing the answer, but it truly is. So what we want to do here, we are now encoding our belief about the enemy's behavior. And so we're encoding it into a Bayesian network that looks very similar to what we just did with the where is my bag example. We have an initial target that we choose, and there is the true target location. Well, at a priori, we don't know where it is. But then there is also the decision of the enemy as to what to protect, determining which hangar to protect and which one not to. And that we can encode. And we basically just need to posit our, position ourselves in the enemy's shoes and say, well, if we're going after hangar number one and it is actually in hangar number two, what would they protect? You know, so they would certainly protect number two for sure, but then they could also protect either one of the other ones and so on. So we can think about what the rationale is, what they could do and what they would want to do enter this in the Bayesian network, enter this in the conditional probability table here, and then reason with it. And so that's what we do. So a priori, um, everything is equally probable. We decide on target and tunnel on hangar number two. Given that, the undefended hangar could be either one or three, but of course the enemy knows where it is. So they will abandon the hangar where it is certainly not. And through that, through that uh, evidence that we see, we see what remains unprotected, we can update our belief on where the true target is. And so we have exactly the same, again, we perform intercausal reasoning here from um, the, from our target choice via our observation what remains undefended to the target location. 
And so what happens, the a priori probability, the equal probability of uh, one third probability of the, the plane being in either in any of the three hangars increases to 66%, two thirds for ne hangar number one, given what we've observed. No, I've spoken up a lot, so it's, it's, you need to be quiet. So Uh -huh. Just make better resonated with me on an intuitive level and, and, and help me understand. Yeah. So, so I, I hope that helps. Some yeah. of you maybe have gotten this more for me. Yeah. Something. And, and, and a card trick you can do too is prove it to yourself. Yes. Even if it makes no sense, you can go through the cards and do it 50 times. Yes. And, be real. and um, that is actually what one of the. I forgot the name, it's a Hungarian mathematician. You probably, many of you will know the name. He didn't believe it. He didn't believe the solution, so he tried it out. He ran 10,000 computer simulations and then realized, yes, indeed, that that's the correct solution. Karen? That's a causal network. Yes. So are, is there any, there's no uncertainty about the causality? No, there's no, there was no uncertainty about the causality. That's correct. So, so okay. There's no way to model uncertainty. We, no, we can't. No, no. I mean, um, uh, well, y y yes, because, um, for instance, in our next example, where we machine learn knowledge, or where we machine learn a network, we discover a structure that is directed, but where the arcs have no causal interpretation. Okay. So in that case... We, we, we cannot make any, we were completely uncertain about what the true causal direction is. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, so this, this is a tricky one, but an example, again, coming back to the point where we need just help because our into, we can't rely on our intuition. It just, for whatever reason, we're not set up to, to, to think that way. And that's where these tools are powerful because, again, we can enter our our causal reasoning. We can even reason about what the enemy would think, and we can put that in fairly simply and directly, and then let, leave the heavy lifting to the computer. So we need to keep moving. Uh, I already see we're running out of time. So the next one, um, I'll just take you through a few slides, and this is about just how how can we get expert knowledge. Because of, so far, I've just taken my knowledge and encoded it directly. I drew the arcs and encoded the probabilities. But how can we now more systematically do that? Yeah, how can we? Um, and the problem is, I said that earlier, that if I simply take my knowledge, all the, the biases that I have in my normal reasoning, I'm simply translating that into the Bayesian network. So all the biases, overconfidence, confirmation bias, all this applies. So one way to overcome it would perhaps be to deal with groups. 
and, and basically overcome the weaknesses of the individual by bringing in a group. But of course, groups have biases too, such as groupthink, group polarization, all kinds of things. So that's not perfect either. So a number of years, well, many years ago in the 1950s and 60s, um, the idea came up, perhaps we can work with interacting groups in such a way that we take the positive from the group, but the diversity of opinion, the variety of sources, but at the same time prevent the negative. So that do we have anybody here from RAND Corporation? Nobody? Okay. Well, RAND Corporation... Would I tell you if it worked? Well, perhaps I would keep that a secret. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so the, the, the RAND Corporation came up with this approach to come up with a reliable opinion consensus of a group of experts. And I'll just touch on it very briefly. At the time, the objective was to understand what the Soviet military objectives were. Of course, we don't have... At the time, we didn't have, we never had access to their, to their plans. We certainly don't have any data, so we'd have to think about what they would do. And the objective was: how many nuclear detonations would it take um, to destroy America's arms manufacturing capability? That was the objective: to figure out what they think it would it would take, so we could derive from what threat can we expect? So, of course, uh, that's not a very satisfactory approach because it's just elaborate guessing. But what is interesting about it is, even though it is unsatisfactory, it is making the best out of it. So instead of just saying, who knows? We couldn't possibly know. It's about systematically querying the thoughts of experts and encoding that. And that's exactly what we want to do here. And uh, we can apply this to many different domains. But here, here's the approach. Uh, where, is my, where are my slides? And I'm, I'm fast forwarding here a little bit just to, to make up for um, me talking too, too much and too slowly, apparently. So this is how, how it works. Um, the idea is that in a group, you would bring together experts with a facilitator and discuss the domain. Talk about what are variables of interest and what are the causal relationship. So the group jointly would build a causal network, but it is purely qualitative at this time. It's just about this causes that, but not about does it increase or decrease or anything, just the causal structure. And they may come up with something like this. To say our domain, that's the structure of it. And then as a second step, the group, the experts would basically uh, separate and then we would query them from the qualitative network they had jointly built and have them assess each part of the network individually. So they can now say how A relates to B. Does it go up? Does it go down? They would quantify individually through a web interface, separate from each other so they don't influence each other. They would provide their feedback and they can provide their confidence level. And for some areas, you may, you know, this is, you're very familiar with it. You, you may set the confidence to 90%, whereas something else, something else you may put it at 50% or, or, or lower. Yeah? So this qualitative network would, would generate queries, ask individual questions to each of the subject matter experts, get their feedback, and through this iterative process, through, through a web interface, basically you answer as an expert, you fill out an online questionnaire that then goes straight back into Bayesian lab and populates that Bayesian network. So um, basically, you, you see, you just see the or the, the facilitator who has the Bayesian lab installed and is running it, sees how the network gets populated, and what is quite interesting, you can get 
you can see where there are high degrees of consensus and where there are disagreements. So you can assess on your network what's a strong and solid part as opposed to where there may be different schools of thought. And based on that, in the next session, you could then raise these points and say, okay, here we have consensus on this one, on that part, how is it that, you know, you say this goes up and you say that goes down? Well, are you thinking, perhaps you're thinking about Iraq, you're thinking about Afghanistan. Perhaps we need to introduce country as an additional variable and then re-elicit uh, the, the assessments. And that's typically how it works. Usually these are like three-day engagements. They're quite intense between the, the qualitative elicitation and the numerous rounds of quantitative assessment. But what is so fascinating in the end, you come up with a network that is remarkably solid, that is remarkably consistent. And you now have a network that represents the collective thinking of your team, of your subject matter experts. And on that basis, it's really powerful how you can carry out discussions. Because if we now say, okay, this is what we all built together and we optimize or we forecast or we uh, generate the optimal policy, and then Russ says, I, I, I don't like that then I'd have to go back to him and say, Russ, what part of this network don't you like? Because we all just went through it, elicited, agreed on it, and said, this is it, this is how the world works. How come you don't accept the output? Because then, then you can have a very, very productive discussion. You don't just have opinions colliding, but you can zero in on what is, what is controversial. Anyway. And you can then use this network as if it had been learned from data. It is computationally no different than a network that, that is generated from data. However, should you get data, like um, let's assume we, we do this about a future product or a future weapon system, and then we actually use that technology and gather operational data, then we can take this network and update it incrementally with actual observations. So, so it's not like here is our expert opinion and here is data and we start from scratch, but rather you take that network and can incrementally improve it with actual observations. So, so the transition from expert network to a data-driven model is, is gradual. So it's like a yeah, you could think of it that way, yeah, absolutely. So, okay, any questions on knowledge elicitation? So you just, if you get data, you just adjust the probabilities, how do you integrate the data? Basically, you then associate a data set and update the probabilities of this network. So you can start updating as soon as you have a single you have hard to weight the data. Yes. You have to, to the you have to say this new data or the experts are worth like hundred data points. So, so you you can basically then adjust the kind of the, the, the yeah the, the relevance of these experts versus the newly observed data. Yeah. So, so how do you make that decision? That's, that's purely subjective. But you have to choose what you believe more. Well, data. You, usually what, what happens when you get data, you get a lot more data. And very quickly the data becomes in quantity much, much richer. And the thing is you can, you can see how much the data is changing the network. You know, whether it's just changing the parameters a little bit or whether the, the newly observed data is actually completely changing the structure. So, th so therefore you can get a sense of um, how much conflict there is. Yeah. So and that's an important point again. Earlier on we talked about conflict. You know, how much does this new observation about a tank attribute conflict with our hypothesis? Here we can observe how does this data point that we have newly observed conflict with the model 
or how consistent or inconsistent is this with the model our experts built? Is there like metrics built in that give you kind of live feedback on your conversions? Yes, you, you can you can you can literally track the the, the fit. You know, so you, can, the, you can compare two networks like that. So you let's yeah. say you had a complete expert network and a complete data network. You yes, can, you can actually compare. You can can two. put them side by side and overlay them. And then see what how the structure differs, and sometimes the structure can differ dramatically. In other cases, it can be very consistent. So, we yes. Yes, you can use the API. We have an API that allows you to take an expert learn model and apply that to data, or in the case of new data that is being collected, you could use the API to, with every single observation that comes in, to update the expert learned or expert developed model. So you can, as data comes in in real time, update your model. Okay, we have 30 minutes left. And uh, we're skipping over quadrant two, that's what I said earlier, pure predictive modeling. Uh, Bayesian networks are very useful, but I wouldn't say it's, it's one of the unique selling points. So I want to go straight to quadrant three, knowledge discovery and interpretation. And here I put, picked a non-military topic, I hope you don't, don't mind. Um, what we want to do is discover structure from financial data. And I think this could be interesting because more specifically, we're, we're looking at capital flows. And I think this could be relevant potentially for mo money laundering applications, etc. cetera. Um, here, we're looking at the, the change of capital inside an exchange traded funds, uh, ex exchange traded funds. Uh, are or are measured in terms of how much capital they hold. It's computed every day, so so we can every day look at the day over ch day capital inflow and outflow. Of course, we only know that for an in individual fund. We don't know if your gold fund, if it has a capital outflow, where that flow goes. So that's what we want to find out. We only see individual funds, money coming in, money going out, but we don't know where that money is going. That's what we want to discover. We were basically, here the question is, if somebody withdraws capital from fund X, where would it most likely go? So it's, a, I think, a very good way of discovering hidden flows of, um, of in this case, money in in, uh, we have a client who works in um, who, who looks at hidden under, underground rivers and water flows where he doesn't know where exactly the water flows but he only has kind of inflows and outflows at certain locations and he wants to discover how all these are linked so what we want to get ultimately is we want to get a deep understanding of what's happening in this world we have all this these, these capital flows, we want to understand how they are linked. Now, perhaps traditionally, you would have approached this with a correlation matrix, kind of, let's look at what goes up and what goes down and how is this all related. And you could come up with a very big correlation matrix and do color coding and, and try to understand it. But first of all, there's a lot of collinearity, so everything moves uh, closely together, and it's a static picture. It's just a, a visual of the relationships. What we want, we want a model, a computational model. We not only want to see what has happened, but rather how hypothetical scenarios would play out. So that's how Judea Pearl defines 
uh, deep understanding. Deep understanding means knowing not merely how things behaved yesterday, but also how things will behave under new hypothetical circumstances. And that's what we want to build. So we want to take uh, 51 exchange traded funds that we've observed over, like, I think, a four year period. And we want to discover a single model that is, is both interpretable, that we can look at, that we can examine, and that we can also compute with. So we can figure out, well, what if? What if this went up and that went down? What would be our expectations? So this is our specific data set. We're looking uh, at a subset of 51 exchange traded funds, or rather, let me back up. We have a total of over 1,100 exchange traded funds, and they are grouped into 51 investment themes. And, and these investment themes could be like energy, financials, industrials, you know, what is it? A treasury, target risk, natural gas, real estate, gold, emerging markets, crude oil. They're all these uh, focus areas, and these funds are grouped by that. And so what we want to do now, we want to learn a model, a single model that includes all these 51 focus areas, and that's what we want to interpret. So when I say learning, what do I really mean with that? Because learning a Bayesian network really is searching for a Bayesian network. We have to look for a possible, about many, many, many possible networks that could fit the data. So we are talking about, for the data set, we have 10 to the, you know, 10,000. Uh, incredibly large number of possible networks that we couldn't possibly all explore or, or test. So what we're doing with Bayesia Lab, we're trying to take clever shortcuts in our search for suitable networks and each possible candidate network we assess in terms of fit and complexity. Because in all, as with all modeling efforts, we're trying to come up with the simplest possible network with the best possible fit. In a Bayesian network, we can use the minimum description length score as a measure, as a very practical measure. And I don't want to go into all the details, but essentially the description length of the Bayesian network quantifies the complexity and the description length of the data given the Bayesian network is a measure for how well the network fits the data. And then if you put those two together, then you get to the minimum description length score. As we learn, as analysts, we have the ability to kind of put our thumb on the scale and influence that search and say we want a more complex or a less complex network. Um, and, and sometimes that's important if we have a particularly small data set or if we have other considerations that dictate what we, what we ultimately want in our network. So that's our score. That's how Bayesia Lab evaluates candidate networks. And what it will look like is, is something like this. We, we won't see that. We could show that. But um, Bayesia Lab, one after the other, tests possible networks, looks at their score, and then tries to improve upon that score, meaning lowering that score. And in the end, we get a score that at the lowest possible score, and that's the network we get to see. So let's do that. Yes, complexity is essentially uh, the size of the conditional probability tables in the network. That's that. That's a yeah complexity. The, the smaller, the better. The fewer tables you need, the better. But of course, as you, as you make it simpler, you may lose some fit. Okay, let me bring in the data, and this is really the most most common workflow. I mean, we've kind of started at an unusual end because we, we started with knowledge and coding. Most of yes. So, thinking about the 
you've got the model. Is there, is there a way for you to say, okay, there's a hundred different factors here, uh, and I don't know how many, you know, then, then interact with your probability, but uh, you know, these ten are the most important. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. And so, so, don't, so don't fit a model that throws out one of them, for example, or, or minimizes one of them. Yes. So, so in this case, this is actually one of the questions. Which one of these, you know, what's, what's the mover and shaker here in, in, this, in this industry? Yeah, that's what we want to know. You can prune out the less important ones after those and make it more simple. Yes, but we, that's really not one of the, the, the key objectives here. So I, I think in traditional modeling, there's a desire to discard variables because we're always worried about multicollinearity and, and, and so on. So here, there's much less of an effort. Let's kind of suppress lesser variables. We rather want to understand how important are they, you know, and, and how strongly or how weakly they are linked and where they are linked. Do you have a complexity problem now? But if there's too many, well, you might be able to reduce that. Yeah, but it, it's kind of an implicit through the search. It 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 would certain nodes would end up being disconnected because they, they wouldn't be discarded. Rather, we don't find any worthwhile relationship with, with the others. But it's not really a pruning. It's re rather a, you know, there, there's no way for them to contribute to the network. It's, it's kind of a the reverse objective in a way. So the, the, the causal network is the flows, money going in, or out of well, here we will not be able to say anything about causality because this is a data, just a data set, and we're machine learning a structure from that data set. So there's absolutely no way we can say anything about causality. So but we, if we're just measuring money flowing in or out and how that affects the network of other. Yes, okay. exactly. So so we can see that. There, is, there, there are lots of associations. There are strong and there are weak associations. Uh, but we can't really say gold drives you know, emerging markets or, or the other way around. We can just say if something flows into gold, it flows out of that. Yeah. So let's do that. I'm just taking you now through the data pre or the, not pre-processing. We're bringing in the data. Here, the data is in a table format. We have four years of observations of all these fund groups here: alpha seeking, basic materials, broad equity, uh, consumer, etc. So Bayesia Lab looks at this and says, does a check whether these might be continuous or categorical variables. Here in this case, they're all continuous. There's a step for missing values processing. And that's, that's very important because so many real world data sets contain huge amounts of missing values. And the commonly used approaches that we take to deal with missing values are often very bad, such as I think list-wise deletion, case-wise deletion, means imputation. They can have terrible effects on your estimation, can introduce biases that you really want to avoid at all costs. What about yeah. outlier elimination? Uh, here we don't have to specifically deal with outliers. I, I will I will address outliers momentarily. Um, so Missing values processing is typically a challenge. Now, the advantage that we have here, as we bring our data in, as we learn our initial model, the network that we learn, we can use to update the estimate of the missing values. So what happens is we learn a network. From all the relationships, we can estimate the distribution of the possible values of all missing values. We come up with a temporary imputation, and then we relearn the network, and then we re-impute, and relearn and re-impute until things converge. And with that, we have kind of the mathematically optimal imputation for the missing values. But important is to remember that this is not a 
permanent imputation, but rather just a temporary placeholder imputation where we impute a, um, a distribution. So it's, it's never a fixed value that we plug into to the hole in the data set. Anyway, uh, here we have no missing values, which is typical for financial data. But one thing that we must do is that we need to discretize. So this is always um, something we need to do for, for continuous variables because a Bayesian network consists of arcs in conditional probability tables. So in order to accommodate the values in the tables, we need to bin all values. And there are no, many ways how we can do it. Bayesian Lab offers us a, quite a range of discretization algorithms, or I should back up, we could manually discretize if we have domain knowledge about what a particular variable means. And for instance, if we were measuring water temperature, then perhaps zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius would be meaningful because that has a physical meaning. Here, perhaps, I don't really have that knowledge. So, so here I might want Bayesian Lab to determine an appropriate discretization so we can, uh, in the best possible way, capture the distribution of, of each variable. So we have a number of discretization algorithms. And again, we could just talk about those for, for several hours. I will choose in this case here density approximation. I will choose that across all my variables. So Bayesian Lab will now bin all my 51 variables and come up with the ideal binning for each of these variables. Okay, let's do that. Shouldn't take very long. Okay, we've just done that. We have brought in the nodes. And now here we don't need to specify probabilities because Bayesian Lab has computed these, the marginal probabilities from the data. So I'm just, just brought up four of the 51 nodes on the right on, on the monitor panels. Yeah. So, but so far we haven't learned anything. We've, we've just brought in the data. Our next step is to learn a model. And perhaps traditionally, when you think about modeling and, and building a model, you might think of selecting a target node, a Y, and then look for a way to predict that. Here, we're going to learn a single model that in involves all the variables. You have a question? Yeah. Speaking of what, what does that mean, the probability of uh, Say it again, please. What it means is the, the distribution of the capital flow over that um, four-year period. So what, how much, if we, if we just look at all the capital, gold, sorry? gold and let's look at, uh, where is gold? Good, good question, where is gold? Let me search for it. Let me bring up gold. Let me bring up the curve. So here it is now. Looks like a very narrow uh, peak. Let me actually look at the, the the monitor. Okay. So here is the distribution that we have for Plum. the distribution for gold. So in 74.5% in of the days we have observed, the, the capital inflow and outflow was between, was in, was in that interval. And in 13.54% of the day, the capital outflow was greater than, or the, the capital flow um, was greater than $35 million. No? So, and we, so we have that captured for all, for all the nodes. 
But what is now interesting, what we want to learn is how, how does all this coincide, the inflows and outflows. And for that, we want to perform learning. We want to learn a single Bayesian network model. And uh, before I could even explain what I'm about to do, finish learning, I, I chose one of the unsupervised learning algorithm that basically looks for how can I fit a single model to all those nodes? I'm simultaneously fitting all a network to all these data points. Let me rearrange that. And here's our initial structure. Now, the, the problem is when we look at a fairly uh, high dimensional network, and this, this is only 51 variables, you could very easily think of hundreds or networks with thousands of variables it very quickly becomes unwieldy. I mean, here it's still kind of manageable. We could zoom in, we can, you know, stretch it apart and, and look at it, but, but still we have lots of arcs that cross over. And, and so it might, it's not particularly easy to interpret, but still let's stick with that two-dimensional representation for, for a moment. Now my <coughs> mouse disappeared, where's my mouse here? So um, we can now visualize what exactly happens in this, this network. We can highlight, to answer the question of what is the most important node, we can <laughs> compute the node force, the, essentially the weight of our nodes in the network. And furthermore, we can compute measures like mutual information, how much information have certain nodes in common. We could compute uh, the arc force. There are many measures that we can examine in order to interpret what all this means. And that's a very important part about Bayesian network is what does that mean? The objective is always to take that to a subject matter expert to say, why is, let's say, gold and alpha seeking, why is that connected? And then we can look at, for instance, what is the, um, the Pearson's correlation? It seems to be negatively correlated. So perhaps a financial expert would say it shows how people move between very conservative investments and very aggressive investments back and forth. I don't know. I'm not an expert in this field. But that's always what we have to bear in mind as we learn a model. That it's meant to be interpreted and a subject matter expert should not say, yep, that makes sense. Or, well, hey, we're missing something or we can't explain this properly until we also have like, let's say, GDP in here or the oil price or some other variables. Well, so that, that's, that, that's, 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 that's the key point. It's not a black box. We should be able to interpret it and be able to validate it with what we know about the domain. In other cases, we may, like myself, I don't know anything about it, so I could now use that purely to educate myself. What's happening in this domain? How are these things related? And then I can perhaps ask questions. Like, yes? Now that it's applied a model uh, precision, how does, how does it represent the precision information? Yes. Exactly. So I've simply learned the model and said, okay, here it is. This is our model. But it's just a, a model. I, I would now, if I wanted to use that, I should really go through necessary validation steps. I would do things like cross-validation and really measure the performance. Perhaps a more complex model would be a better fit or... Uh, I, I could even use different learning algorithms. Absolutely. So here, what I would do typically, I would do a. I can go through an arc confidence analysis, jackknife bootstrap data perturbation. Data perturbation, for instance, would be artificially introducing noise into the network to see whether we can still recover the same structure and so on. But that's a very important part of building a model that you're really sh fairly confident that, that this, this, is, this is the right thing. Um, so um, 
actually let's let's do one of these let's let's perhaps do um, the R confidence analysis let's now rerun this learning ten times and then compare the structures that we found yeah, so this is the this is the reference structure this was the original model that we found but if we look at different subsamples of the data, there are occasional arcs we can find. And, and so by looking at the synthesis, synthesis, we can see the black ones. The black arcs are the ones we find on each iteration, you know, with every subset of the original data set. So we can be very confident that these are not spurious relationships, but they, they are actually certainly there. We, we find those arcs consistently, but then others, um, by their th thinness, we can tell, well, this was only, we only found this one, in one, one subset of the original data. And based on that, we can make a judgment, um, is, this, is this good enough for our purposes? So, but, but furthermore, we could now evaluate how well does this network fit the data and uh, is it appropriate for our purposes and so on. Yes, Russ? What's the difference between the straight edge and the arc edge? Oh, the arc edge just indicates how they, how they are linked. Um, An arc is directionality. Here in this case, we have no directionality. In the report, we, sh we also show directionality. For to explain the arc, take a look at our book. That's it's a kind of a, a lengthy explanation. Okay. Yeah. So, and and we, we only have five minutes left. So, uh, I'll, I'll be br brief in all my answers. So, but as as I said, this is starting to become quite quite difficult to interpret in two dimensions because there's just a lot of stuff going on in our network. So at this point, it is often helpful to go into three dimensions. And I've just brought up our three-dimensional mapping. And initially, it's simply translating our 2D network into a three-dimensional space. Right now, it's, this is still as flat as a pancake but I can apply a layout algorithm that now untangles that so we can kind of look at this like, like a molecule. And at this point, a lot of relationships become a lot, lot clearer, especially once I turn on some of my key measures like node force and like, let's say here, Pearson correlation, then I can, I can really zoom in and, and try to get an understanding of hey, what's, what's going on here? What's related? And I can visualize di different measures, node force, arc force, um, and then get, get a feel for what, what is happening in my domain. Now, even here, you might say, you know, this is getting pretty busy for, for a flat screen. There, there's only so much I can see in this pseudo 3D uh, representation. At which point we can now take this and transfer this into virtual reality. So that's where we take this very model and now project it inside an Oculus Rift. So you, you literally look at this as a, as a three-dimensional structure that you see in, in space, and you can use your touch controllers to, 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 to touch the network, to move it around, and kind of playfully explore the structure until it's almost like, yeah, you know, you, you touch a physical object and look at it from all sides until you acquaint yourself with that object. Initially, I thought, you know, how is this even going to work? But when you, when you do it, you really, once you walk through your network and look up at, at different nodes, it's, it's just actually a very natural way of learning, a very intuitive way of engaging with with a network, it has become a physical object and you can manipulate it like a physical object. And I think, at least for me, uh, that, that's a great way for learning and understanding in the context of knowledge discovery. Now, I don't have an Oculus Rift here, but I can show you what, uh, at least what a screenshot looks like.
and what you would see fr from inside uh, the oculus. Now, uh, and then of course, as you look around, you can look at all sides and bring it closer and move it further away and so on. So, um, we have now run out of time and the, the topic, one of the very interesting topics we will not be able to, to talk about, uh, that is uh, about knowledge discovery in causal inference. I have an entire example prepared that I think you'd find very interesting. And here, this would be about evaluating the effectiveness of information campaigns or disinformation campaigns about uh, influencing, um, potentially influencing foreign countries. I came up with a little case study about hypothetical countering anti-American attitudes in Germany and, and how you could measure something like that and evaluate the effectiveness. We don't have time. Uh, you will have it in your slide deck and I'll have a very similar example recorded on video that's available in our webinar archive. So uh, I'm sorry we ran out. So I'll just uh, jump to my, my concluding remarks. Um, this, this is everything you missed. A couple of things I wanted to share with you. We have three-day courses coming up. Um, and, and here is, is the, the old schedule. I, I just pulled up and my, my new presentation has crashed. So I'm pulling up an older one. Uh, we have three-day courses coming up. Uh, Bayesian lab courses that introduce you to the entire framework of how to use Bayesian networks for research. Uh, it goes through a lot of exercise, and I think so, some of you have signed up for for the upcoming course in Chicago, and then we will also be hosting some private courses, internal courses for individual organizations. That that's quite common. If you have a group that's bigger than that's seven, eight, or nine then it's worthwhile bringing a course like that in-house. Uh, as I said, we have a one coming up in Chicago that's in the context of our annual conference. We have an annual conference where Bayesian network researchers come together every year presenting their work. Niraj will be there. Dave will be there. Uh, perhaps Freeman, think about coming you guys can present. So we always have interesting topics, uh, interesting presenters from all over the world on, 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 on different domains. And yes, as I said, that will be in Chicago this year. Uh, it would be great if you could think about joining us. And with that, despite the, the hiccup here at the very end of my presentation, um, I very much appreciate your time and interest in this. Uh, I appreciate all your good questions. I would love to stay in contact, so please feel free to reach out with questions. Here are all my contact details. Um, whatever it may be, I'd love to talk about using Bayesian networks in your particular problem domain. If you haven't scanned in yet, uh, please swing by, let me scan you or let Dave scan your ticket so you will receive all the slides. And with that, um, oh, one, one last thing. If you have time, we are, um, we have scheduled, we have set aside a few tables and a, and a room over at Craft House uh, Brewery or what's it called? Brew house, craft house, craft. It, it's 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 the, the the pub across the street. Uh, if you just want to join our team for for a drink for for a glass of beer, please please do join us. Would be great if we could continue our conversation a little bit offline. With that, thanks again. Really appreciate your interest. <clears throat>